You're listening to the Topco Business Unusual podcast. So fantastic. Welcome to uh, this week's um, episode of Business Unusual podcast. This week, I'm joined by Sean Riley, who's the CEO and founder of Ad Dynamo. So I, I noticed we're both in Cape Town. Um, so <laughs> we probably should have done this over a coffee. But uh, Sean, welcome to Topco's Business Unusual podcast. Um, I, I was saying to you beforehand that um, I did some research and, and I, di- I didn't know that you were working for the FBI, but um, we, we were trying to do some research into like your background pre going to Stellenbosch and really didn't have any. So I don't know if it's a, great, a, a good time to start off and sort of talk around what you're doing and sort of, you know, uh, you know, a bit of your history. Sure. Rolf, thanks for having me. Um, give you a short bit of background. Uh, so yeah, um, was raised, um, you know, between sort of Durban and the Cape and, um, you know, went to high school as settlers and yeah, I was, uh, ended up living on a small holding and my last three years of high school was a 110 kilometer motorcycle commute on a 50 back in the days when you weren't allowed to own more than a, more than a, a bike that size and you were, you had to avoid, avoid all the highways. So long, long trips in, in and out of school, but also, you know, building a love for motorcycles along the way. And then, um, yeah, Stellenbosch University, uh, I did, I studied applied maths, I did not finish. I got to the end of my final year and I just had too much financial pressure paying my way through uni. And, um, you know, I just got, got to a point where uh, a professor who I was very close to actually encouraged me to to get out into the into the world um, he, he said you're an entrepreneur you know I think you know you should you should get going and uh, towards yeah towards sort of the end of 1998 I ended up in London doing a few sort of really dodgy jobs ranging from temping at office angels um, sorting out f- faxes um, working at a place called tip top turf packing roll on lawn on the back of lawn harvesters in the snow and um, then eventually got very lucky and landed a job with, um, with Credit Suisse in London, where uh, my first boss there also became one of my very best friends for the rest of my life. I won't ask you how you got that job. I'm sure there was some entrepreneurial... Uh... Well, well, actually, the interesting background is that I knew the job was in futures and options, which I knew absolutely nothing about. And... Um, but the bank was busy transitioning from Lotus one, two, three to Excel. And so anyone that knew Excel was in hot demand. And when I'd been at Stellenbosch University, I'd made spare money lecturing Excel um, to first year students. So my Excel, um, my Excel knowledge um, helped land me the job and kind of like figured the, figured the banking bit out as I went. <laughs> So, I mean, it sounds like you've got this pure entrepreneurial spirit. When did it first come? Did it come at school or did it come at university? How did your, te- you know, how did your lecturer sort of see that flow? Yeah, I think um, so from school, you know, I would always, um, when, we, when, we, when we lived in Belleville, I would um, have a, a Saturday market stand down at Belleville Market where mm-hmm. I would occasionally steal some of my mom's pots and pans to sell things that, that had value. And eventually when I ran out of household goods or I got caught enough times, I eventually would start going to sort of wholesalers. And I actually bumped into an old school friend the other day who told me that his parents still have the uh, frog fridge magnet that they bought from me back in as uh, sort of the, the early nineties. And yeah, I would, uh, I washed teachers cars for spare money um, I, you know, uh, I, I studied home economics for my first two years at high school. So then I started um, baking scones for all the neighbors. So I always, there was always a bit of hustle and always looking at uh, ways to earn a bit of, earn a bit of cash. Um, also did a paper delivery run from, you know, from when I was about uh, 10 years old up to 15 at sort of 5 a.m. every morning. So, um, yeah, there was always, a, always quite a lot of hustle. And, uh, and I think it wasn't, you know, never only about money, obviously, uh, but sometimes just a way to create something from, from, you know, to, it's quite rewarding to, you know, come up with an idea and actually, you know, even if it's one rand or 10 rand to be able to feel like you, you created something from an idea. I mean, it's amazing listening to your story. It's almost like I knew 
that was going to come through from where you are now. And I often think of people like rebels at school or young children who are hustling, that they're the ones that we need to support in terms of entrepreneurs to give them a bit of support. I mean, what support did you get from your parents or friends around you? Were they, were they also entrepreneurial or was it, was it something that just came to you uniquely in your family? Yeah, I think um, I don't really, um, you know, I wasn't really surrounded by friends that were entrepreneurial, but um, my my mom, uh, you know, and I would say that my family were entrepreneurs, but they were bad entrepreneurs. Um, you know, so they were, you know, observed a few uh, terrible business decisions um, to unfold and fail quite quickly before my eyes. Um, and I would say probably, um, you know, probably occasionally a few good ideas, but with a, a lack of uh, purpose or drive to see it through. But my mom was always uh, very supportive of, of anything that I, that I wanted to take on. So she, you know, she was always there. She, she always backed me and, uh, and tried to help out wherever she could. Yeah, it's amazing, eh? So you did the London stint. You did quite well. You landed this top job at Credit Suisse. Uh, again, uh, it'd be amazing to hear that story, how you got the, the real job. Maybe there's a, a book or a movie coming out soon. But, but, the, but then, you know, you spoke about um, coming back to South Africa and the reason for that. Yeah, so actually there was a, a very clear catalyst that drove that decision. So I was um, incredibly happy at the bank. And, um, you know, I'd actually um, started to program quite a lot out of um, frustration because we were we had real risks um, that tallied up to hundreds of millions of pounds within our department. And you would go to the IT team and then they would want to have an eight-month project plan and numerous meetings. And we were kind of saying, like, the risk is today. Like, you know, if you know anything about futures and options, is something very scary called variation margin. And, you know, if you are one, one cent out today, that could be a million rand tomorrow. Or, you know, so, you know, so we had like immediate pressing needs. So out of frustration, started coding, got a lot of feedback about how shitty my code was. Um, and, um, and then, you know, you know, but kind of like just observed that there was sometimes a need for a, an immediate solution, maybe not elegant. But it, it turned out that the particular piece of code I wrote was used by the bank for 18 years. And Microsoft actually built a case study on it to feature the longevity of source code. And so, uh, yeah, so, you know, I kind of, um, you know, I was, and I was allowed to be entrepreneurial within the bank. So my boss allowed me to solve problems outside of my job description, as long as I was getting my, my job done as well. And I, um, I kind of scaled up on uh, fuzzy logic at the time, which is really the precursor to what AI is today. And, the, you know, the, the, the premise of fuzzy logic was built on the fact that we all historically have solved everything with zeros or ones, very binary way of thinking, and that actually uh, most things in life are not quite a zero, not quite one. Nothing is quite blue or quite green. It's somewhere in between. And so I've been scaling up on fuzzy logic, built a derivatives trading system um, using fuzzy logic, and I got sent to the head quant um, at Credit Suisse, who... Um, was, you know, very smart, uh, consulted to the Bank of England. And I walked in and I said, oh, I've been asked to come and share my idea with you. And I started talking, obviously young, in my early 20s, very nervous, standing in this enormous office. And um, 20 seconds in, he interrupted me and said, oh, hold on, sorry, um, do you have a master's degree in maths? So I said, no, I don't even have a degree, a completed degree in maths. He said, oh, well, we can't... Uh, and he said, well, sorry, we, we can't talk anymore. <laughs> he said, I, I, he said I, can't, I can't continue the conversation. I only work with people with masters and up. So I said to him, you know, but, um, but you can't learn fuzzy logic at a university today. It's, um, it's, you know, it's not subject matter at a university today. And, um, and he said, well, that doesn't matter. I'm not interested. So he, I didn't even get the chance to show what I had built. And uh, that was my moment where I just decided... Um, you know, I've, I've felt that um, back in South Africa, I would um, have an opportunity to get in front of the right people if I had if I had a good idea. And that was sort of the moment where I decided to uh, leave London. It's amazing, eh? Because I think there's a, there's a lot of people. I read today, I think it's like this three thirty six thousand 
US millionaires in South Africa, and about 3,000 of them last year left. So that's 10%. That's a lot of wealth going there, right? So you're thinking a lot of wealth, there's a lot of businesses maybe going there. But the evidence is, is often what we're seeing is the people making the real money, creating the opportunities are going against what everybody else is doing. So it's yeah. interesting you say that. And then, so then what happened? So got back to SA, um, a friend and I, um, we, we had a, a few businesses um, to generate money, literally rent. So I was quietly coding an online share trading platform. Um, and uh, we were doing a, um, a little bit of trading of our own. And to pay the bills, we were actually had bought two more P tents, which we were pitching, <laughs> pitching for people, uh, you know, over weekends and so on to earn some, like you know, actual cash while we, while we ticked away at our ideas. And um, yeah, the my my share trading platform was um, gained the notice of um, a listed company at the time called eData, and they acquired acquired our business, um, but very young, very naive, um, thought that I'd made millions uh, because that's what the contract said. But, um, you know, it was, you know, all to be paid over a couple of years and no real money earned up front. Uh, but we were also just very happy to have salaries. I mean, you know, to, you know, to be banking a fixed salary suddenly and to be able to go out and buy a, a half decent, you know, my friend and I had actually shared a car for year, for a year or so, <laughs> and uh, this and actually um, a good story to share is that actually while we were negotiating this contract back then for 14 million rand to sell our share trading technology, um, the CEO of this listed company was in town, and I was driving him to meetings on the back of my Vespa. <laughs> 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 that was the mode of transport, and I was just like, "Sorry, this is it." And uh, he was sit on the back taking phone calls while I scooted him around town. <laughs> Oh, uh, did you get your money? No. So, so the story, <laughs> uh, it's still, um, you know, a, a bittersweet story. So um, we, we licensed our technology to E-Trade in the US um, and we deployed E-Trade South Africa for them. And then um, during that year, the, the listed company's business model essentially, you know, collapsed overnight. They were, they'd made a lot of money by actually building uh, landing pages on their site for listed companies for investor data. And very quickly, as the internet accelerated and evolved, these listed companies got wise to the fact that they didn't need to pay 20,000 Rand a month for one web page that could actually build the entire website and they didn't need a third party. So these listed companies started sort of pulling back and um, we got to an interesting position that within a year of being acquired, um, our owners were living off our revenue. And, um, you know, so, we, you know, and it was, we were also so close, you know, but it was beautiful, you know, to 99 to be exposed, you know, to, um, to E-Trade in Silicon Valley and to the way they did things was fantastic exposure. And so we, you know, to be able, you know, that was, that was a great journey to go through. And by the end of the year, we realized we're not going to get paid. We saw the projects over the line, went live with E-Trade. And then I, I needed to find a lifeline of funding to help us to essentially take our company back and, and um, you know, skilling up 25 developers back in the 90s was really hard to do. Um, you, know, you, you know, developers weren't, you know, weren't hanging on trees. So I saw a lot of value in the people and um, we needed a bit of capital to, to try and sort of, you know, um, take, take that company back and get going again. So I'd imagine that's where JT Ferreira and the guys that, Yes. Came in, right. So how did you meet him? I mean, yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's actually, so GT, um, had heard of me through town, but um, we had never actually met. And, um, I, I asked, the uh, um, so, so yeah, a really interesting story was that, um, I'd actually been at a, been to a restaurant called the Cameron in Stellenbosch, which is quite iconic. And it used to be sort of you know, very much the place where the Ruperts would go and where, you know, there would always be an empty table, no matter how busy they were, people would queue to get in and have dinner there. And uh, I'd been there for dinner and my, my meal was not great. And the manager came out and said, oh, you know, you know, what's wrong with it? I said, oh, the bolognese, I couldn't eat it. So he called the manager, Mario out, who came out hopping mad and he started screaming at me and he just said like, Yo, give me one word. What does it taste like? So I said, well, dog food. And he went absolute, absolutely berserk. And then I, I said, 
I'm not paying for the food now. You know, you can, here's my name, number, I'm not paying. So he called the police who surrounded me in the restaurants. Um, so six cops surrounding me. And um, anyway, I eventually managed to get out of the situation. But the next day, all over Stellenbosch, you know, which is a town where news travels quick, um, you know, I people say to me, oh, what did you do wrong? Why were you being arrested? So I was like, you know, young, hot-headed. So I was like, screw that. So um, I'd, uh, I filed a lawsuit for defamation against Mario. Um, and, <laughs> and GT, of course, was good friends with Mario, and he frequented the place as well. So he said to a friend that he would meet me, but I had to drop the, the lawsuit because he, would, he wanted to broker peace, and he would give me a better outcome than what any court ever would. So I was like, okay, I don't really have a choice because I need to save my business. So um, dropped the lawsuit and um, yeah, we met for lunch and Mario came over and apologized and uh, GT pulled me aside halfway through the lunch, listened to the idea and he wrote a check right there for 3 million rand and um, on a handshake. <laughs> and uh, Incredible. it's quite, you know, it's quite, so two parts of that story that I have to just finish with for you is that, first of all, Mario and I became real friends over time. I DJed his 60th birthday for him, and he's still a very good friend, and he's an amazing human. And uh, GT and I, you know, have, you know, then, you know, sort of, you know, you know, gone this sort of, gone through this journey together over all these years. And we've never had a contract, we've never had a piece of paper, and we've never had a dispute. Awesome, man. Eh? So, I mean, your powers of persuasion must be quite strong. <laughs> well, um, thank you. But yeah, um, yeah, I think sometimes you do also just connect with, uh, you know, sometimes people do connect. But yes, um, it is that, uh, you know, we are in the job of persuasion at a dynamo. <laughs> <laughs> so also like taking no prisoners or taking no ship, that's also something you've done. And it's not just the only time, right? I mean, to a restaurant owner is one thing or manager, yeah. but to Google, that's a whole nother thing, right? Yeah, yeah, so that was, uh, that was quite a scary moment for us, right? Um, you know, it kind of, you know, threatened our entire livelihood and um, yeah, we managed to, we're not, still not really allowed to talk about anything. Uh, okay, okay. And, but what, I, but what, I can, what I can tell you, of course, is that yes, we went to the competition tribunal to to get some kind of remedy. We ended up um, settling the matter eventually directly with Google. And um, the beautiful part of that story though, is that years later, when a Dynamo had found traction with its ad network, Google had become our biggest customer. Um, so, you know, sort of just before we won Twitter in 2013, Google was uh, represented 92% of our client base. Wow. So you, you you're happy to have fights, but you're good at making up. I think, uh, fortunately, Ralph, you know, not, not many fights. Um, you know, I think like sometimes you have to, um, you know, sometimes you have to be, um, you know, I think, yes, you have, there are moments where you have to choose to be brave. Um, but, uh, but I would say like, you know, for a very long um, sort of, you know, you know, journey and career so far, there's, you know, been surprisingly little friction and I'm very fortunate for that. Yeah, I think one of the things that really comes through, though, is um, your adaptability. And so for someone who's got businesses and people investing in it and you've got these programs, you've adapted quite a bit through that process. But a lot of people are scared of change. And certainly what COVID's done has made us all change. But how do you deal with that? Like internally, how are you coping with knowing that coming to South Africa or, you know, you went along one path with the business and you sort of changed to add Dynamo from what you were doing. Yeah. How did you internalize or deal with that? And what were the sort of the tactics that you use when you have to make these sort of hard, brave decisions? You talk, you call it brave, but yeah, it's like brave one moment at a time, but what's your thinking process? Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm very comfortable with change and, um, a lot of people, a lot of people aren't. Um, so like the change has never been, um, a big, a big issue for me. And I'll say sometimes like, you know, sometimes I'm possibly too comfortable with change. And I can tell you that if we, you know, if we look back to the intelligence days, the business with GT that then founded at Dynamo, um, you know, we, we, we chase too many different things and we, uh, we, you know, we, you know, and, you know, 
you and I chatted earlier about sales, and I'm sure we'll get into that a bit later. But, you know, in hindsight, looking back, you know, we actually built so many great things. And um, sometimes when ideas fail, we tend to think it's the idea that failed. Nine out of 10 times, I believe it's just sales execution that let you down. And, um, you know, you can be the smartest entrepreneur and you can invent the most unique thing out there. But if you, if you can't, you know, ramp sales, um, then, you know, it's just not going to happen. And, um, and that was, you know, um, you know, so we, I probably embraced change far too much for the first 10 years. We, we built a lot of different things and we had some success along the way. Um, probably a, a success story for someone else that I was a part of. Um, I can definitely say we built and sold something way too early in its life. So um, my gates, the, the payment gateway, we, um, we, were, we built that out of frustration because back in sort of 2008, there was only really one payment gateway solution called Ivory, which was um, not, a great, not a great platform. And we felt there was an opportunity to introduce an alternative to the market. So we built, uh, we built a, a payment gateway and sold it um, to Margate for the grand total in 2008 of um, 800,000 Rand. And uh, <laughs> we, were, we were sort of you know, very happy with it because we had spent very little building it and we had put it together in a few months and this offer came out of the blue and we were like, damn, yeah, we'll take that. And anyway, the long story short is they then sold that five years later for 23 million euros. <laughs> how do you sleep at night <laughs> I'm, I'm now over the pain but um but, you know yeah, over, uh, are you over it yeah uh, it's just um i've got to you know like that, that you know cash didn't really you know sort of i can't reward myself with cash on that one but i can stroke my ego to say that i was part <laughs> of its creation yeah but so that's the best i can get out of it Oh, wow, man. That's so, that's so interesting. So, I mean, maybe just talking about sales quickly, because I think you, you mentioned it, but um, I think there's two things is that Robert Kiyosaki, you know, the, the journalist asked him, how, how did you become number one selling journalist? He said, yeah, number one selling, not writing or best written journalist. And I think the other one is recently, my father sent me a, an article, for, I think it was the Times, and they talked around how... Um, some of the, the, the news channels, I think it was BBC, they didn't have um, anyone really advertising, media was a bit lower, but they had a fund where they were going to invest in tech startups. I don't know if you saw this. And what they did yeah. is they, they, they invested in these tech startups, gave them airtime to help them to grow. And these failing or fledgling tech companies suddenly absolutely shot the lights out. Right, yeah. and it's all to do with getting your name out there, marketing and selling exactly what you're saying. I mean, what's your thoughts on well, that? Well, actually, just on on that one around the investments, um, like one little caveat that I can add before we talk about sales is um, what I found really interesting is years ago we we had quite a lot of conversations with um, Intel's VC. and um, Intel, what they actually do when they invest is they actually contract themselves to get their investee companies in front of any, any 20 C-level execs from the Fortune 500 for 30, minutes every, for 30 minutes each year. They contract and guarantee that they will do that for you. How incredible, um, that's worth more than the money, right? To be able mm. to say, we could put you in front of Salesforce's CTO. And um, so that, they actually put that down when they, when, they, when they contract themselves into investments. So just the, uh, an interesting one on like you know how they recognize that your ability to connect with the right people and um, tell your story and pitch your story and sell your story is critical to your success and as critical as the funding you can raise is, is that it i mean I, we've got a partners and what they said is that they're trying to help companies that they know are very successful to get more work um and the, the challenge is they know they can do the work they're in sometimes the pictures of these friends they're giving these opportunities to and they mess it up Right. Yeah. And so there's this thing like, what are, what are they messing up? They know that they can know they can do the work. But when it comes to the pitching and the selling of the company, the products, they're doing it. Yeah. What, what, I mean, you've, I know that you spoke about what you've learned from Twitter. Yes. So I think, um, I think obviously, so with Twitter, um, you know, they, they're incredibly, you know, and they are fortunate in that it is a platform that there's something for everyone. 
you know, um, you know, if you're a rugby lover, if you're a football lover, if you like VC, you know, there's, there's, there's something for anyone. So we, we can always find a way to tell the story in a way that's relevant to Ralph. And, um, and, you know, so I think that, that makes it very, um, that makes it very um, effective for us to sell. But what I think they taught us is um, the importance of sort of knowing your decks. So, you know, when we launched in South Africa, we, we were, you know, they didn't send juniors. We walked around with, um, you know, a global vice president and, and one of his team members, and we watched them present 47 times in five days. Sure. And, um, and by the end of those five days, he was suddenly throwing me and some of my teammates into the hot seat to say, now you go. And um, so there, you know, there are quite a few um, techniques that we learned in terms of, you know, how to tell the story, how to get the room excited, how to hold interest. Um, there are a few things that I'm quite um, passionate about. So I talk about, I always talk with our new sales team members, I always talk about um, leading, leading the presentation with your words. So, you know, instead of like flipping up a slide and saying, here are the African user numbers for Twitter, and you're talking about something that everyone can read, that's not a very wild wow moment. But what you, if you know your deck really well, or you have presenter view, you're able to actually say, I'm going to talk to you about Twitter's user African numbers now, and I'm pretty excited about them. And everyone's, you've got the, you've got the room, right? You haven't showed it yet. And then you flip to that. And so just, you know, so like, you know, for me, that's like, it sounds so obvious, but it's like just such a subtle nuance in the timing of how you present to kind of make sure that you have the attention and not, not your screen. Um, the, um, in terms of how they present, you know, we, you know, you know, we often see that, like, you know, a lot of presentations look great, but what's the actual story? Like, what is the narrative here? Like, what is the, you know, what is the emotion? What is the, you know, what is the problem that you've identified? How do you think you're going to solve it? And, you know, and so we, you know, we often talk about, um, first of all, we often talk about internally, we'll talk about sales leaders. So, like, what is the emotion or the rationale that you do? The, the, the one thing that you plan to tap into in this presentation. And sometimes it'll be something as, um, you know, sometimes it'll be a real business problem. Like we think we can find you more customers or make you more money. Very often it's not. Very often it's um, ego. Ego is a, a very strong, a very strong reason to buy. Um, you know, if, if you take someone inside a global brand as well. So global brands, everyone in the global brand desperately wants to be noticed and seen by their peers across the globe. And if you can go into a global brand with a local office and say, we actually think this work is so great that we will help you get it showcased globally by Twitter um, if you were brave enough to do it. And, uh, and, you know, so sometimes, you know, ego will help you get over the line. The one um, habit that we have on our decks is that we have a hidden first page uh, or first slide where um, the creator of that presentation has to, in one sentence, be able to write out the purpose of this deck. Like why... Why am I going to be in the room today with this? And what do I hope to achieve? And that, and that purpose helps to keep you focused. Um, you know, I'm yet to pitch a 3 million rand order for Christmas. And I'm not going to get distracted with low-hanging fruits and the clients are asking me to do some quick things for 20,000 rand. So this is my purpose. And then we actually force ourselves to write out our narrative in three sentences or less. Um, like, what is the, the journey of this story that I'm telling, like, you know, how, you know, what is the, the logical flow? And the reason we do that is that usually you, you, you often find that you've built a very pretty deck, but there's actually no narrative. We've just, we've just cobbled together 20 great looking slides and there actually is no memorable story behind this that evokes any kind of emotion or, or need to buy. I'm just, I'm just wondering what your deck was like when you sold to a left. So uh, <laughs> well, well, Aleph, we're actually very lucky, you know, Aleph know our business as well as we do, because, you know, we, you know, it's, it's, you know, they're in exactly the same game and we've known the guys for so long that um, uh, it was also interesting, you know, chatting to a lot of M&A guys, they will tell you that they will go through a process for companies looking to sell, but nine out of 10 times you end up selling to the one that you've known the longest and, um, you know, very often, like they will, yes, they'll bring other buyers to a table, but very often it, you end up buying to the actual one company out there that you had a relationship with already. What, what changed that made you want to go on that journey? 
Or what, what was it? Is it is it to do other things, or is it to didn't feel like you had the capital to grow? So I think um, so. Obviously, in Renfin, being um, you know being a major shareholder in at Dynamo um, as a VC fund with an investment that was 11 years old, that's ancient by VC standards. So um, you know, so it was important for them at some point to realize a um, an exit. And, uh, and for the rest of us, it was, um, you know, also quite attractive to team up with a global player that, um, that understood our business. And so for us, um, you know, obviously, Aleph, um, you know, it's no secret, they're going through, um, they've raised a lot of capital globally now. And um, Twitter's also made an investment. But for us, the capital was not, not that necessary, but the, the global relationships, access to platforms that we don't represent yet, um, so I think the, the ability to sort of really, um, you know, sort of accelerate our growth um, has been, you know, what, what attracted us. Yeah, I suppose also the experience of like just that growth creation. Yeah, I think it was like 98% of businesses never get sold. Um, only yeah. 2% do. So like most people build and work on a business and, and they're not really creating wealth. They're just, you know, paying themselves a salary if, if actually the business allows them to anyway. Yes. So I'd imagine you learned a lot through that process. I'd love to tap into that. But I mean, maybe just going back a bit, because you've, you've talked about the presentation skills. And I think one thing I try and do is also just ask a question um, when I'm doing a presentation as well, but a silly question, right? So I, I find that, that engagement before you give the answer, yeah. you, need, you need them engaged, right? Or else it's yeah. like you're just talking to a, a friggin' morgue. Um, yeah. so, so on the sales side of things, because I think you and I have the same belief that, you know, a business really, I don't know, I, I speak to so many entrepreneurs and they feel exactly the same way. If you're going to scale and CEOs, if you're going to scale a business, you're going to run a business it's around the sales. Like if the sales aren't coming in, you don't really have a business. You can have a great idea. You got to grow the sales team. And like you were saying a little bit earlier, you indoctrinate your sales team, which when you said that, I was like, yes, this guy is so cool. Uh, how do you do uh, that? So I think uh, we learned a few interesting lessons, Ralph, and the one, um, you know, so the one thing that was fascinating for us was when Twitter came into our lives and our sales force went from three or four people to 20 people overnight. Um, what surprised me was that a big sales team is much easier to manage than a small sales team. Um, and because, you know, when you have three people in the room and you're like, hey, Bob, what's happening to your numbers? It's, it's very personal, um, you know, and it, and it feels like, you know, you're attacking poor Bob and not talking about the numbers. And also, Bob knows that, you know, he might not be a star performer, but, you know, um, I'll never lose my job because then they've cut their sales force by a third. Uh, you know, so, and we also had some markets where we had one salesperson, you know, where if we, you know, lost that person completely, we had a zero sales force. So um, we actually found that um, small sales teams are very hard to manage and it's, um, and it can be quite personal. And what was amazing for me is like, after our first few Twitter sales meetings, you literally are just pulling up the numbers on, on a big screen and talking through how, how everyone's doing. And suddenly your, your non-performers are proactively coming to you with a performance plan because the writing is literally on the wall. Um, it's not like, you know, um, and when there are 20 people and 18 are achieving, um, there's also, you create, um, you create belief that it's possible. Some people can hit those numbers. Why can't you? Um, and, uh, you know, and so we actually found that like bigger sales teams become self-regulating and, um, and much easier to manage. So that was, so we also, whenever we launch uh, new platforms or new markets, we're always very cautious. We, we always want the opportunity to big, be big enough to, to launch with a handful of salespeople rather than one. Um, it just, it's, it's, it's quite tough. And it's also not, not nice being that one guy who's not hitting the numbers. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I always talk about a, a moment that um, Stuart Kuss from Inventfin shared a, a link with me many years ago. And um, I'm not a shareholder. I've got no relationship, but 10XE is a local consultancy that publishes a lot of free content and also helps businesses look at the, um, you know, what are the characteristics that help you, you know, transition from being a startup to a scale-up? And how do you really, how do you become a business that can, you know, achieve 10X growth? And um, I remember reading this article probably six or seven years ago, and 
one of the, obviously one of the key traps is that in the early days, CEOs, founders do need to be heavily involved in everything, including sales. But you do have to find a way past that if you ever hope to, you know, to achieve scale. And um, that was a wake up call for me because I also love selling, but I also realized that if I try to hold on to that, all the key relationships, we would never really, I would never be able to focus on other things that mattered. And I think that was literally a, a watershed moment for us as a business where we recognized that we did have great people and uh, they were capable of selling. And a lot of them are capable of selling much better than I am now. And, um, you know, to kind of, you know, take that leap to step away from that um, took, took a lot of courage. Yeah, I think it's a big thing, right? So they've got three things why founders, why, why companies don't sell. Wrong sales, good salesperson becomes a sales manager. A good salesperson becomes a sales manager and sells himself or the founder or CEO is involved in the sales. Those are three sort of big yeah. reasons why it goes wrong. So, um, so, so choosing a sales team, is that a big thing for you as well? Like getting the right people on board? Or do you find that the culture takes care of that? Like when you got that, like you're saying, when you got that 20 people in a room, obviously natural competition takes place anyway. And people want to sort of like the ego takes over in a way, right? I do think, um, so I do still think that hiring, well, yeah, obviously hiring well, and then, um, you know, um, but we, we definitely place a far bigger emphasis on um, passion, um, personality, um, knowledge does not mean too much for us, because knowledge can be trained, but you can't teach someone to care. And um, so, you know, so I do think that we look at a lot of those softer characteristics. Um, one of my favorite you know, when, you know, when we pitch, when we're looking for salespeople, I often brief them to come in and present something totally out of um, the industry. Like, you know, I've had one before where actually our, our former head of brand strategy came in and crushed his interview when he was hiring with us. And his mandate was, um, I've never ridden a bicycle before. You need to come in and pitch me. You've got three days to prep and then come and pitch me why I should start cycling. And um, for me, like that's a, you know, like it's, it's a great way of sort of like pushing the knowledge aside. So you're not sitting there vetting their knowledge of Google ads or, um, because they can go and they can be taught all of that and focusing on their ability to just tell a story and persuade. That's so good, eh? Yeah, it's, it's so important as well. I suppose that everything's changing all the time as well, so you need to have that that sort of ability. And I suppose the caring thing is it's changed as well. We've, we've started taking on Sandler training. I don't know if you guys are using that. US, probably Twitter's probably pushing something similar to that. Yeah. Um, and more that empathetic sale, listening, engaging more than the closing the deal. But going on to the word sales, because I know that you mentioned no one wants to be called a salesperson, even if you are selling. Yeah. So what's with that? What do you do? Yeah, there's this, um, no, there is this very South African um, nuance that like people know that they're hiring for a sales job, but they always ask the question, what will my job title be? And you can you have to put lipstick on the pig to make them comfortable. You can't be a you can't be a salesperson, but there'll be an account manager, an account coordinator, a biz dev, um, and you know the sooner that you know the sooner that people embrace the notion that we are all in sales, and um, and being in sales is a great thing. Businesses don't exist without sales, uh, the better. And another aspect to that as well with um, our partners such as Twitter. You know, the first few quarters when we started with them, um, they'd be like, Sean, you know, you, 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 you know, this, this client hasn't spent this quarter and you're going to miss the number. And I'd be like, yeah, you know, but, you know, the relationship's good. We're in a good place. They'll probably spend next quarter. It'll all be cool. And they were like, Sean, we're a, we're a listed company. We report to shareholders quarterly. And, um, you know, we can't tell shareholders that um, the relationships are good, even though the numbers aren't there. <laughs> and um, so, very quickly, we had to, to, and it's very un-South African. I think South Africans, uh, we sell on relationship. And we know that if the relationship is good, numbers will happen. But there is also that aspect of, and you start to appreciate it in time that, yeah, if you do miss enough quarters, you do miss the year. And if you miss enough years, you, you miss completely. And so, you know, um, something that we work through with new hires is actually coaching them that, you know, the platforms that we sell for, um, are measure, measure themselves quarterly, which means we measure ourselves quarterly. And that is a non-negotiable. And the sooner you learn to embrace it, um, you know, you're getting to work with Yahoo, with Spotify, with Snap, with Twitter. Why would we try to not learn 
the way these businesses are able to scale and grow and try to impose our, our, you know, our viewpoints on them. So it's something that we work very hard at to um, get, get buy-in from the team and get an appreciation that that is how, how the world works and uh, we need to catch up. Yeah, I think a lot of entrepreneurs or founders sort of don't like to join listed companies because of that. But actually, those things can be very positive for a business because of that outside almost pressure or mentoring, I suppose, that's really so important. So how did you get it right? Because I think that was one of the other pearls that you said. You're like, we, we, we learned the magic of selling, we learned the magic of presenting, and then the magic of forecasting. How, how did you get that right? So it was, was it just creating it as part of the culture and, and making it early on? So I, I think, um, you know, if you take sort of Twitter, Snap, Spotify, Yahoo, but Twitter was quite formative for many of our earlier years. And um, what, they, what they do exceptionally well is that we, we feel like we're part of the organization. So, you know, we, are, we sit in the same training as their employees. We have the same access as their employees. So, you know, a lot of uh, good habits do rub off. Um, you know, we, we chatted earlier about forecasting and the forecasting side. So, you know, my kind of forecasting in the past, which never worked, would be like, I think we can do 25% this year. And um, based on zero science, you know, like, <laughs> zero science, no, like just a, a desire to grow and, um, and no idea how I would achieve that. And, um, and actually what we, what we do at Twitter, and it's not like, it's not, it's not secret, um, but we use a bottoms up, uh, bottoms up forecasting method. So every quarter, every account exec literally has um, the historic data for their accounts that they represent. They have conversations with their clients and based on what their clients are saying, they actually have to do a forecast per client. And so we, you know, so, you know, so we do granular forecasting for each quarter based on every conversation with hundreds of clients. And then we roll that number up and that's our target. And, um, and, and yes, yeah, sometimes you will say, Oh, this is going to, this, this will only grow us by 18% year on year for the quarter. So we're going to try to push for a bit more, but, um, but generally we accept that number. And it also means that then you can go like, as your quarter is progressing, you can identify exactly which accounts are, are the problem areas and, and how to help get you back on track. That's some great, great advice. I'm going to be using it. Thanks for that. Um, I should be paying you for this. So, <laughs> so, I mean, I think one of the things that maybe, I don't know if you're aware of, but we use Twitter, we use Facebook, LinkedIn, and we use it for campaigns for our products. And we have obviously partners that come on board. And I think, I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but one, what we've found is that Twitter has given us the best um, also analytics back data on, yeah. you know, what our customers are doing. So we can then serve that back to our customers and we can actually show them a return on investment where we find yeah. LinkedIn and Facebook and definitely Instagram is very difficult because of people's, I think it's the, the, the poppy or the GPRs, I'm not sure why exactly, but it, it's very hard to track performance where Twitter is so easy. Yeah. So I you think you're wrong. I think you did. No, you're not wrong. You, I am very biased. So I'm like absolutely the worst person to ask for an opinion on this. But um, yeah, no. I, think, I, I think especially for, for what you do, um, you know, where Twitter becomes so powerful, of course, is that it's not just giving you hard metrics, but it's giving you interest overlaps, follower overlaps with your audience and I think that that sort of um, that audience data that you get is that's very unique to Twitter and I think uh, you know Twitter is also able to do that because the pat platform is entirely public um, so there is just so much rich data for you to mine um, you know and yeah I, I just find it fascinating you know as you know just like being able to see oh wow you know um, you know 50 percent of my followers are actually into mountain biking and uh, you know I should you know like <laughs> You know, so, you know, there's so many sort of like interesting caveats there that go beyond like hard data. For sure. I think like one of our customers got over 100 million rands worth of PR from Twitter alone with one of our programs. It was crazy. And, and I must tell you, it wasn't our go-to market or our main activation, but it 
we're, it's becoming it this year. So our focus has definitely shifted. It was almost like by accident we saw it. It was one of those really wow things that was... Yeah. So now I'm like uh, super happy to have this podcast because I think we really want to double down on it. It's like, it's quite clear when you're getting those results and you can see it, then you can do something about it. It's easier to track and measure and whatever. So, I mean, you, 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 you've merged now, well, you've been brought out by LF and um, yeah, that's obviously quite enriching for you and the team. What's the future? So, uh, yeah, world domination. <laughs> now we... Uh, so obviously, um, I think, uh, you know, like quite a clear mandate from Aleph has been, um, you know, we are, we are their Africa footprint. So, um, you know, and we have, you know, over the past few years, been accelerating our growth uh, beyond South Africa. Our office in Nairobi continues to grow. Um, our presence in Lagos continues to grow. So, you know, Africa is very much our priority. Um, Few interesting facts, though. You know, we we actually run Snapchat sales in Ireland as well, um, and we've actually we've been pretty quiet about that. Um, not because it's a secret, but um, because it it kind of um, it convolutes what has always been a Dynamo story. A Dynamo, you know, historically we we did try to take on too many geographies, and it actually it wasn't well received by advertisers because they were kind of like, you know, you know, what's going on here? You're in Brazil and Germany and Spain and Africa, what's the connection? And we couldn't explain it. And, uh, you know, so, you know, when we, when we focused on, you know, really being, um, you know, um, the, the leaders in Africa, that, that accelerated our growth. So, but yeah, we, we do operate um, in some markets outside of Africa. And I guess in future, you know, we'll work with the LF teams to figure out who in the group is best equipped to take on certain territories. But there's so much opportunity right here that, um, it's going to keep us very busy for many years. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because I, I remember seeing a press release about how you're going to take on the world and then you, you really just focused in on Africa. But it's definitely been the, the payday. It's like you, you had a plan and you adapted again. And so I suppose it's a, we, a lot of South African companies, I think, are looking at overseas markets, but the market's here. It's Africa's the yeah. market they need to be looking closer at because that's where the, there's so many listed companies that went to the US or UK yeah. or was, and then had to scuttle back again because yeah. and now they're growing into Africa. You, you know, um, one tough lesson for us. So um, at Dynamo also um, built a technology business called Blue Robot, which, um, which was not bought by LF. So original shareholders still run that. And um, I'm no longer involved there day to day. But most of Blue Robot's business is now out of Europe, the UK, the US. So it's become a, a truly global business. But... What we, the biggest mistake we made, and um, it's a terrible thing to acknowledge, but, you know, British people don't want to buy from South Africans. And, um, you know, and we are respected for our ingenuity and hard work, but, um, you know, Brits also, like Brits and South Africans don't work well together in a client and supplier environment because we are super direct and British people are not, you know. And I remember when we set up our office in London for Blue Robot, I left every meeting thinking I'd crushed it. And then the client wouldn't take my call for two years. And, uh, you know, so, so, you know, uh, you know, the UK was incredibly frustrating. We also, um, we also um, got to this point where we actually heard whispers through, you know, some of our larger partners um, where people were saying openly to some of our clients, blue robots, great, but for Africa, but you know, they are African based business. I'm not so sure I would trust them with, you know, something for your major markets. And so that was, um, so we actually, you know, Blue Robots was born and bred and built proudly right here in South Africa. But the story we tell abroad is Blue Robots is London headquartered. And we, we used to flood that office with South Africans and we stopped. And unfortunately that accelerated sales. And it's like, it's, you know, it's a bittersweet story, but we, we had to eventually adapt to you know, we were hearing this feedback and this concern and we eventually, and we are all guilty of it. You know, I was, I found myself, you know, I was um, searching for some sales software not long ago. And as soon as I saw that the customer support n number was in India, I was like, no, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I don't feel comfortable with that. And, you know, probably, you know, and it's, we all have these prejudices that, um, that, you know, it, you know, that, that sort of, you know, affect the way we buy yeah, I suppose it's, we see it with the multinationals coming into South Africa, though. 
So when Microsoft came in initially, you know, they, they had to adapt to the environment. I suppose that's what you're saying. You have to, you can't go there all guns blazing. We've got all the answers. You've got yes. to localize your product to the to the market you're in. Absolutely. And so uh, this merger and acquisition that, that you, that, that, well, the, 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 the deal that you did, what, what did you learn from that? I mean, I suppose there's, there's not enough international investment there's not enough deals like that happening. So obviously having someone, an entrepreneur like you doing that is it's like folklore. So, um, you know, we'd tried a few, um, you know, so definitely sort of the one thing that we learned is use an expert. So, you know, M&A uh, and, you know, actually the guys that we use, I, I say the guys we use because they produce the work of a team, but it's one man. Um, so one, it's a one man band based out of Oxford and he's exceptional and he produced, um, you know, he produced incredible work and probably more importantly in, you know, previous efforts of ours to feel out the market and so on, we, we just got the feeling that a lot of the, the previous parties we had worked through just never really had the juice to talk to real decision makers at big international potential buyers. So, you know, like I, for a long time, you know, felt that Adobe was actually a, a good fit for us. And um, all the previous m a people would just say to me yeah adobe's past we'll have to keep looking and you'd say well okay who did you talk to and you get these sort of big stares uh you know so you know, i just got the feeling that a lot of the guys we had worked with in the past like weren't and the guy we used he literally he he speed dials the head of m a for for google for facebook for twitter i got a lot of double feedback you know during that process i actually had the, the guy that I report into at Twitter calling me two hours later to say, we just had your man on the phone about possibly investing. Um, so I was getting a lot of double feedback from those organizations that I knew. And what was also um, super valuable was that he built an Excel spreadsheet that um, he literally logged the specific feedback. He didn't just say to us, I've called 500 people and they've said, no, I'll keep going. He actually logged every conversation and the specific feedback. It's not for them right now because they are only going to start investing in Africa in two years from now. They are very interested in your business, but they want to see you grow revenue by another five X before they take a look. Um, so the feedback was also, you know, like during the process, I was feeling that no matter what happened, we were, we were gathering such a large amount of Intel on what, what potential buyers would want to see over time. Yeah. And, and I suppose that like you mentioned that, he also helped you to find the right metrics for how to get the best value for you guys. Um, yeah. How important was that? I mean, is, it, is I suppose every business needs to do the same sort of thing. It's like you know, making sure you're going up the right ladder, right? Because yeah. you could get it in the wrong way. Yeah, and I highly recommend that, you know, um, and he was able to very quickly explain, you know, that, you know, um, a sales business like a Dynamo would, be, would always be sold as a factor of EBITDA, Whereas, um, you know, software as a service business such as Blue Robot would be a multiple of revenue. So that immediately gives you a very, a very clear, you know, like at Blue Robot now, we suddenly are a lot less focused on how much profit we make as long as we are profitable. But Blue Robot's agenda will be, you know, revenue growth and um, because that is what drives value. And I've, I've, I've got a good friend who sold a business called uh, CyberLogic um, quite a few years ago. And he actually went through the process with um, a local M&A crowd who are really good as well. And um, he went to them and said, hey, I want to sell my business. And they said to him, well, this is the value you can expect. So you're not going to be retiring. And I was like, oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so they, you know, they had a very short conversation, but, but gave him the recipe that he had to work towards. He went out, um, managed to acquire um, a, a smaller business similar to his spent a year and a half grafting to merge them and then went back and achieved a great outcome. Sure. So, so Sean, I mean, just wrapping up, because I know it's been a, a long time, but um, for you, looking at Africa now is, is one of your focus areas. What, what growth are you seeing there? Are you seeing like 20%, 25% year on year? Are you seeing it as bigger? Um, do we need more South Africans to stay and get involved? What's the story? Yeah, so I think um, a lot of businesses look at Africa and they, they um, you, know, you know, there are markets where um, it's much harder to generate a sale than others. 
So, you know, Nigeria on face value looks super attractive because of the massive audience that you have available to you. And you can, you know, you can launch a, a digital platform there and find, you know, especially as South Africans, we get sort of, you know, very overwhelmed when we see real scale because we don't have that in South Africa. And you switch something on in Nigeria and you suddenly have 12 million active users um, without it even trying. So, and sometimes that can uh, seduce us. So there are definitely markets where, you know, for us, Nigeria is still very much, it's an investment for the long term. There is a lot of value right there, but it's, um, but it's, a, lot of, it's, it's a lot of hard work right now for, um, you know, for, you know, a far smaller reward. Um, for us, Kenya is a really interesting market. Um, it punches way above its weight consistently. Um, I also think it's, um, it's, you know, sometimes you also have to, you know, think about the human side of it. Like, you know, um, you know, would you be, would you be comfortable sending um, a workforce to Lagos every two weeks? You know, because, you know, we actually find that that's quite hard on, not everyone is wired for that. So I love the hustle, the energy, um, but, you know, also like, you know, a long trip to Nigeria can be uh, tiring because you tend to avoid meat because you're not always sure what it is. And so, you know, like a, a no protein diet for two weeks can take its toll. And, uh, you know, so they, they, even the human nuances of like, you know, um, would my team be able to travel here? Would they be able to be safe? Uh, you know, and, um, and then obviously, ultimately, though, you have to, you know, we're very much uh, behind local talent and, um, you know, local talent on the ground. But um, yeah, for us, uh, Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, Tanzania, are the, the really interesting um, growth markets for us in Africa right now. I think there's, there's also a lot, um, it's an area that we have not really been successful at, but, it, but an area where we still believe in a non-COVID world has a lot of value is, you know, the, the export markets with um, high tourists, such as, you know, when I say export, the, the markets that are selling what they have to foreigners, such as the tourist driven markets, Seychelles, Mauritius, Botswana. Um, we believe that there's, um, a lot of untapped value there. Um, yeah, so yeah, very excited about 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 it. Um, also, um, becoming a lot easier. You know, in the past, it's always been very hard to get money out of Nigeria. Um, it's um, you know to the extent that I've even heard stories of companies have bought yachts before, and that yacht they've literally bought a yacht and sailed it to Cape Town, and that yacht is their asset that they then liquidated in Cape Town again. So, um, you know, like, you know, they've been, you know, we've, you know, not long ago, sort of six or seven years ago, we, we used to have an employee in Nigeria walk into the bank and our bank has a US dollar account for us and a Naira account, but you can't transfer between the two at the bank. So we literally would have a guy walk in and withdraw the equivalent of 750,000 US dollars in Naira, which is a pile about this big and uh, in Naira and walk out of the bank to a guy on a shoebox and he will take the money and disappear and come back two minutes later with your clean US dollar bills. And you walk back into the same bank and deposit it. And we've, we've had to do things like that in the past to, to operate. Unfortunately, that is busy maturing. <laughs> I'm sure you've got some great stories. I'm looking forward to the coffee that we have next week. Uh, yes. It was really amazing to do this podcast with you. Thanks so much for being so generous with your time and your information. It's really amazing. And uh, yeah, it's awesome. Thanks so much.